Good afternoon, section Z. Time to start chapter 10 on the law of servitudes. So let me pull that up. So we're over here on page 487. Um, so what is a servitude? Usually we're talking about some kind of an interest in land that places a burden on a piece of land often but not always for the benefit of some other piece of land and that typically arises from a private agreement uh, between landowners or between a landowner and someone else. Um, notice here they have a chart on 487 with different kinds of servitudes and so we will talk about some of these, uh, less about others for instance, um, we will talk very little about profits, but that's basically a right that one person has to come onto land owned by somebody else and to remove something. So if you had the right to cut timber from somebody's land, that would be a profit. We won't do much with that. Uh, we'll talk more about easements. We'll talk about uh, licenses in our, the course of our discussion of easements. We'll talk about covenants. But I don't know if your book has exactly the same chart on page 487. Uh, this was an early set of page proofs, and so they might have corrected this later on. But I wanted to kind of note one thing, if you do have this, uh, this uh, figure in your book, that it's incorrect. Um, when it classifies real covenants and equitable servitudes and places them under the category of profits, that actually should be down here under the category of covenants. So there are subcategories of covenants, there are real covenants and equitable servitudes. We will get to those after our discussion of easements and licenses. Um, so over on page 489, we get into the discussion of one kind of servitude, an easement. And there is a distinction that the authors draw between affirmative and negative easements. And so an affirmative easement is one that gives a positive right, uh, an affirmative uh, right to do something on land owned by somebody else. And so kind of a most uh, common example of an affirmative easement would be like a right of way. Um, I, if I have an easement over my neighbor's property, I have the right to go on their property and drive over or walk over that easement to get to someplace else. Um, and since it gives me the right to do something affirmative on somebody else's land, it's an affirmative easement. Um, there are also a small category of what are called negative easements, which don't allow the holder to do something on the other person's land, but instead allow the holder to prevent the landowner from doing something that would be harmful to them on the landowner's land. So they're restrictive in character. Um, most easements are affirmative. Uh, the courts very early on restricted the number and kind of negative easements, but just recognize that there is such a thing as a negative easement, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later in the chapter. So um, we're going to talk in this lecture about some terminology and about uh, the creation or express easements. Um, and let's do that in the context of the first case they give us, uh, the Willard versus uh, First Church of Christ Scientist case on 491. Um, notice they tell you that an easement is an interest in land that's within the statute of frauds. Um, and so generally you should have a written instrument for an easement, although we will note some exceptions to that instances where easements can arise even without a written instrument. Um, but here in Willard, we're talking about an attempt to create an easement in a deed, and so uh, there would not be any statute of frauds problem in the Willard case. So in the Willard case, there is a lot, which is called lot 20. There's a figure over here on page 492 that kind of shows the property in question. Um, and basically lot 20 is over here across the street from the First Church of Christ Scientist. Um, and the owner of that lot is Ms. McGuigan. Uh, 
Um, and while she is the owner of that lot, uh, it's across the street from her church. Um, and so she lets her fellow church members park in her lot uh, so that they can uh, easily access the church building. Um, in fact, she testified that she bought the lot so that she could provide parking for the church. But she eventually ends up selling lot 20 to somebody named Peterson, who had also purchased lot 19 next door. Um, the deed for parking said that, uh, the, the deed for lot 19 said that the deed was, quote, subject to an easement for automobile parking during church hours. And that deed was recorded by Peterson. Uh, Peterson then turned around and sold lot 20 to Willard. Um, the deed from Peterson to Willard did not say anything about parking. So there wasn't an express mention of the easement. Um, so one question is, well, could Willard defend against the church's easement by saying he was a bona fide purchaser for value without notice of the easement? Um, protected by the recording statutes? And the answer is no for a couple of reasons. I think, one, there's an indication in the book that Willard was told that uh, the church would want to park in the parking lot, so possible that created some form of inquiry notice uh, to see if he, to, uh, where he might have uh, been obligated to inquire to see if the church uh, had some legal right to park there. Um, but beyond that, uh, he had constructive notice from the record because the deed from McGuigan to Peterson actually mentions the easement in the church, and that was in the recording system. And so if Willard had done a proper title search, he would have found out about the easement. So he can't claim to avoid the easement by virtue of being a bona fide purchaser for value without notice. Um, so Willard is trying to quiet title in lot 20, trying to have ownership of lot 20 not subject to the easement mentioned in his chain of title. Um, and instead, he is relying upon a different uh, idea. There's a common law rule that you cannot reserve an easement in property to a stranger to the title. In other words, you cannot reserve an easement for a third party uh, under this common law rule. Um, and so this California court has to decide, well, are we going to continue to follow that common law rule that is found in our earlier cases? And the court rejects that rule, says it's not going to follow it anymore. Um, the court has different reasons for rejecting the, the common law rule. They say that, um, first of all, it fronts, frustrates the, the grantors or the party's intent. If, if the party's intended to create an easement in a third party, uh, this common law rule kind of prevents them from doing so uh, without any good reason for, for frustrating their intent. Um, and the court also thinks that there would be inequitable results um, if you applied this common law rule because the parties to the deed that included the easement, presumably included the presence of the easement in negotiating the purchase price. Um, and so presumably the purchase price was discounted. It was less than if you purchase property that did not have an easement on it. Um, and so it would be inequitable to then let somebody apply the common law rule and get out of uh, the, the uh, easement when it was taken into account in the negotiations between the parties. Um, so that raises the question, should we assume that the parties did take the parking easement into account when they decided what Peterson was gonna pay for lot 20? McGuigan testified that she did. In fact, she said that she reduced her asking price by I think a third or so because she wanted to have this easement in favor of the church. Um, but what about Peterson? Should we assume that Peterson took the easement into account? Um, what if he knew about the common law rule that you couldn't create an easement in a third party that way and that he uh, negotiated knowing that the language in the deed about an easement was not enforceable and so didn't worry about it, didn't, uh, did not take it into account in deciding the, the price? Well, I don't know. I think that that sounds kind of like he's taking advantage of Ms. McGuigan's ignorance at that point. So the court uh, prefers to assume that uh, Peterson is also ignorant, I guess. Um, now, the court abandons that common law rule that you can't uh, reserve an easement in a third party, but they 
don't necessarily think that, uh, that it should be abandoned in all cases. So they abandon it prospectively for deeds that are created after this case, um, that rule will, no, will no, no longer apply. But there could be situations where the old common law rule will still apply retroactively um, if there is a balance of equity suggesting that it should apply because it was somehow relied upon by one of the parties to a transaction. Um, so what might be a situation where somebody would rely upon the existence of that common law rule? Um, one example that, uh, that you might think about is a title insurance company, right? A title insurance company might have done a title search uh, might have found a deed that had an easement in favor of a third party to the transaction um, and decide to issue a title insurance policy anyway because it knew about the common law rule and relied upon it to, uh, to conclude that that uh, easement would not be enforceable. Um, maybe in a situation like that, you should still apply the common law rule. Now, uh, let's take a look at the notes after the case. So go over to 494, note one um, goes into what the modern state of the law is on this issue. Uh, the third restatement of property supports the result in this case, um, that you should be able to reserve an easement in a third party or create an easement in a third party to the transaction. Um, but there are other jurisdictions that uh, still apply the common law rule, including some that are uh, relatively recent and so uh, still kind of divided case law on that issue. Now, note two, how would you draft documents so as to carry out Genevieve McGuigan's intent and not violate the common law rule that an easement cannot be reserved in favor of a third party? Um, so think about that for a second. How could you draft around the common law rule. Um, and this is like some of the other problems that we have had earlier in the book, where sometimes through use of two different documents, you can do something that you couldn't do in a single document under property law. So how might you be able to use two different documents to get around that common law rule? Um, well, the author suggests a couple of ways. So first of all, document one, uh, McGuigan, who owns lot 20, conveys lot 20 to the church. And then in document two, the church conveys lot 20 to Peterson, but reserves an easement in itself. And so then it would be an easement reserved in the grand tour rather than in some third party and would not violate the common law rule. Um, or a second possibility that the authors mention. Um, document one, uh, that McGuigan conveys the property to Peterson in fee simple without any mention of an easement. And then in document two, Peterson conveys an easement to the church. But you do that all uh, as, as one kind of course of conduct sitting around a table uh, at closing to make sure that it all gets done properly. Um, the authors ask another question, if the church had lost, would the church's attorney who drew up the deed be liable for malpractice? Um, and so here the question is really, would a lawyer of reasonable skill uh, know about the common law rule and know about how you could get around it, how you could uh, create an easement uh, that would benefit some third party to the transaction? Note three, the court here applies a rule that you cannot reserve an easement in favor of a third party. Um, but there is a technical distinction in the, the law between reservations and exceptions. Um, and so they tell us that a reservation is a provision in a deed creating some new servitude which did not exist before as an independent interest. Um, and then they tell us that an exception is a provision in a deed that excludes from the grant some pre-existing servitude on the land. Um, and so now at the bottom of 495, uh, the authors ask a question. 
now that you understand the difference between a reservation and, ex and an exception, does the court's statement in footnote one that an exception cannot vest an easement in a third party make sense? Well, it makes technical sense if by vest, you mean you're creating a new easement. Um, but if there is already an easement on the land in favor of some third party, um, there's no reason that I know of or that the parties uh, that the authors mentioned that you couldn't accept that pre-existing easement from the deed. Um, and so maybe it's it's technically right, but but maybe not that important. The point that the authors make, uh, or the, that the court makes in that footnote. Um, now, go over to note four on page 496. Here, the authors draw your attention to a distinction that's made early on in this chapter between easements appurtenant and easements in gross. Um, and so what is the difference between those two? Now, for this, I want to go back to page 489, where that distinction is first introduced. Here we go. Um, so, in addition to the distinction between affirmative and negative easements, easements are also classified as a pertinent or in gross. Um, and they tell you that an easement a pertinent gives the right to whomever owns a parcel of land that the easement benefits, and the easement in gross gives the right to some person without regard to ownership of land. So the basic distinction is, is this an easement that benefits some piece of land and whoever owns it, or is it an easement that benefits some person uh, who doesn't have to be a landowner, in which case it's an easement in gross rather than easement appurtenant. Um, and so back on page, 496, the authors ask, um, is the church's easement in the Willard case a pertinent or in gross? Um, and then they give you a hypothetical to test out the significance of that distinction. They say, if the Christian Science Church sold the church on Hilton Way in San Francisco Boulevard to a Methodist church and erected a new church a block away to the west on Hilton Way, would the easement belong to the Methodist church or to the Christian Science Church? Um, or would the easement be extinguished, they ask. Um, and so, but if it was an easement appurtenant, then presumably it would go to the Methodist church uh, because it benefits the lot where the church building is located. But if it was an easement in gross benefiting the Christian Science Church, then it would travel with them to their new building, um, or, you know, even after they relocate, and so they would still be able to use it uh, as an easement in gross. Um, and so what evidence is there in this grant as to whether this should be viewed as an easement appurtenant or an easement in gross? Well, the language of the easement is over on page 491. Um, and so here's what it says. Uh, the church's attorney drew up a provision for the deed that says that the conveyance was subject to an easement for automobile parking during church hours for the benefit of the church on the property at the southwest corner of the intersection of Hilton Way and Francisco B Boulevard. Such easement to run with the land only so long as the property for whose benefit the easement is given is used for church purposes. That seems to make it fairly clear that this is an easement appurtenant. It is an easement that runs with the land um, and benefits that particular lot where the church is located, at least so long as it's used for church purposes. So that sounds like in response to their question, if they sold the building to the Methodist church, the Methodist church would get the benefit of the easement to park on lot 20. Um, now, does the distinction between easements of pertinent and easements in gross affect your ability to assign the easement? Um, we're not gonna go back, but take a look at page 490, and the authors give you some information about the assignability issue. 
um, and they tell you that the benefits and burdens of a permanent easements pass automatically to the assignees of the land to which they are pertinent. Uh, if you in, if the party is intended, um, and if the burdened party has notice of the easement, um, and so if it's an easement appurtenant, um, then if the burdened land is sold, and the parties intend, and the uh, the taker of the land has notice, then the burden of the easement would go with the servient tenement. And if the dominant tenement is sold uh, and it has an important easement uh, on the Soviet tenement, then the new owner of the dominant tenement would now get to use the easement. Um, easements in gross, the issue of assignability is more complex and kind of has changed over time depending on the jurisdiction. Uh, and so they tell you that um, under the first restatement, an easement in gross could be assigned if it was commercial in character. Uh, the third restatement says all easements in gross uh, are assignable even if they are not commercial. Um, and the uh, authors tell us that most of the recent cases permit any easement in gross to be assignable if that's what the parties intended. Um, now, on page 496, Note four, um, second paragraph here, they tell us that an easement can have a duration comparable to any of the possessory estates. An easement can be in fee simple, perpetual, or, or for life, or for a term of years. How would you describe the duration of the easement in Willard? Remember that the easement said that it lasts so long as the property is used for church purposes. Um, and so that sounds like it is a determinable easement. And so you remember the fee simple determinable, what gives a fee simple estate so long as land is used in certain ways. Here, the easement seems to be determinable. Um, it exists so long as the dominant tenement is used for church purposes. Uh, good stopping point. We're gonna move on and talk about licenses uh, and easements created by licenses next.